Welcome to Freda Chando Analysis, ladies and gentlemen. Your support to the channel is really amazing and I take it with profound humility. And with the same humility, allow me to request you to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. Please give our videos many likes so that YouTube can recommend them to more viewers. I bumped into a story in one of the international newspapers. And the story talks about how African leaders sign secret deals with the West, the USA and European countries. And this story explains that sometimes vice presidents or deputy presidents or some powerful ministers who are eyeing the big seat to occupy presidency, the office of presidency, sometimes go behind their bosses and they sign secret pacts with the European countries so that they can be held in the subsequent elections and in turn they reciprocate by accepting, giving much market to the European goods and they usually dance to the tune of the Western countries. And in particular, the news was explaining that in many occasions, the sitting presidents are always working with the East. So that is maybe China, Korea, Russia, and their deputies realizing that uh, the West is very uncomfortable with such deals, they go secretly and promise that when they are assisted to ascend to power, then they will switch from the East to the West. I looked at that story and I related it with our case in Kenya. Because I remember when Uhuru Kenyatta and William Samuel Ruto ascended to power in 2013, they inherited everything from Mwai Kibaki. And you all know that Mwai Kibaki had uh, switched to the east and Mwai Kibaki was doing business with the Chinese government. That is when there was a lot of introduction to motorbikes. You remember sometimes back in Kenya, motorbikes were not as rampant as they are. In fact, the mode of uh, transport for the common man was the bicycle, otherwise known as Boda Boda. And then when Kibaki got into power, the Chinese government came and we, they infiltrated our market with their locomotives. And then the construction of roads, you remember the thicker superhighway, courtesy of the relationship between Mwai Kibaki or the, the then Kenyan government and the Chinese government. So Uhuru Kenyatta took over and perpetuated that legacy for two terms in 2013 and 2017. And it looked like William Samuel Ruto realized that there was a sinister motive and uh, Uhuru Kenyatta was not going to hand over power to him. And so he decided that he was going secretly to sign a secret deal with the West. Remember, Uhuru Kenyatta and William Samuel Ruto had together signed a deal to build and construct the standard gauge railway and to expand very many roads. There was a very good deal between the Uhuruto government and the Chinese government. So William Ruto had realized that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta was supporting Raila Odinga and he decided that the only thing that was going to help him was to run very fast just like many African leaders do. He knew Uhuru Kenyatta was still holding the sword. He was the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces. He was the head of, head of state and the head of government. So secretly, William Samuel Ruto was invited to the USA and they had a meeting. Thereafter, he proceeded to the United Kingdom, Britain, and he met other leaders there. 
experts and political pundits believe that that is where the deal was sealed. And William Ruto promised them, among other things, that he was going to accept the GMO materials. You remember in the Uhuru, when Uhuru was the president, they had banned the importation of the GMO materials. And I've uh, analyzed here that the GMO market comes from the USA, United States of America. In fact, uh, I analyzed about the USA in trouble with the Mexico because Mexico wanted to ban the importation of their GMO corn. So William Ruto, among other things, accepted that when he was assisted to ascend to power, he was going to accept GMO. There were other things among them, uh, human rights, he was going to improve on human rights, you know, to stop human rights violation. Because in the Uhuru government, I think the, the police had coined a way in which he was dealing, uh, the, the police was dealing with, with, with criminals and drug dealers. And uh, I had uh, the human rights uh, groups complaining that there was mass silencing of criminals and they were saying that they should be apprehended and taken to court. And so without Uhuru knowing what was happening, William Ruto had coiled himself, they had signed a deal, and when uh, William Ruto came back to the country to campaign, he knew very well that there was nothing that was going to stand on his way to become the president. In fact, if you listened to the campaign language that William Ruto had coiled, he was telling the government, that is Uhuru Kenyatta and his handshake partner, that he was not afraid of the deep state. And many kept on wondering what William Ruto meant, because usually in Africa, a sitting president has what we call the deep state. All the ministers are campaigning to support the sitting president or his candidate. The police, the military, everything. And when Ruto was saying that he was not afraid of the deep state, you know, people thought he was daydreaming, and very many people could not just understand what he really meant. Yet he knew they had signed a pact. And you know, when you have the USA behind you, Europe behind you, that force is more powerful than anything. In fact, very many people, if you ask them, political pundits believe that it reached a point when Uhuru Kenyatta was told, you are an outgoing president please stay out of your succession and that is how he lost it because Uhuru Kenyatta really wanted Raila to become the president the fifth president of Kenya there was a time Raila Odinga's daughter was asked whether she thought or she believes that Uhuru Kenyatta should change them and Winnie said that she does not think that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta should change her father, but the only thing she does not understand is at what point did the former president Uhuru Kenyatta lose the control of the deep state. As the Mio supporters or Raila Molodinga's followers always believe that in, in 2007, 2013 and 2017, Raila won the elections, but it took the intervention of the deep state to rob Raila of his victory. And this time round, when Raila had shaken hands with the Uhuru Kenyatta, all the Zemiu supporters were sitting home pretty, waiting that after casting their votes, they were home and dry. They were only waiting for Raila Moludinga to take oath of office. And if you ask anybody in Kenya, both living locally and those who are uh, in the diaspora, they believed, they waited with bated breath because they knew this time it was home and dry. Little did they know that there was something cooking in the slopes of the United States of America and Britain. It did not end there, ladies and gentlemen. 
Having shot, changed Uhuru Kenyatta, William Ruto came back to the country because he knew very well that at some point the former Chief Justice David Maraga nullified the election in 2017. And William Ruto confesses that when he went to State House after Maraga had nullified the elections, he found out that Uhuru wanted to give up. That's what he says. And you remember the common say that he almost slapped Uhuru Kenyatta because Uhuru wanted to give up. And he says that he told Uhuru Kenyatta not to give up. He told Uhuru Kenyatta that they must move on. He cheered him up. And that is when Uhuru got the courage. And their first rally after the nullification of uh, that election, Uhuru pronounced himself that even though the judiciary had uh, colluded to rob them, them of their victory, he said, and I quote, we shall revisit. And that marked the beginning of a very hot enmity between the executive and the judiciary. So the Uhuruto government and David Maraga judiciary were never good friends. And William Ruto and Uhuru Kenyatta were in it together because, wait, he mentioned that Uhuru wanted to give up. And so he is the one who cheered up Uhuru Kenyatta to go for it. And they went for that re-election, an election that Raila had, Raila, uh, had uh, instructed his followers to boycott. And so Uhuru and uh, Ruto got their second term. So Ruto went behind and negotiated with the judiciary. And he told the judiciary that when I ascend to power, I'm going to make up for what Uhuru has done. Because remember, that enmity resulted into the judiciary budget being cut down. It was slashed and reduced. And Maraga complained that this really impacted very negatively into their operations. And Maraga complained that the backlog of very many cases in the judiciary was as a result of the slashed budget into the judiciary. And when the Judicial Service Commission had recommended that some judges be added and to be sworn in as appellate judges, Uhuru Kenyatta vehemently refused some of them and he questioned their characters. And this compounded the enmity between the judiciary and the executive. So William Ruto went and told them that if I get your support and ascend to State House, then number one, I will ensure that I replenish your budgetary allocation. And number two, I will ensure that all the judges that Mr. President had declined to swear in, I will swear them in. And so, the deal in the USA had been sealed. And the deal within the judiciary had been sealed. Then William Ruto looked again because he was a man on a mission and he realized that even prior to that very bungled election there was bad blood between the IEBC the independent the, the, the body that uh, manages elections in fact this is what resulted into a combi fleeing back to the US because she just realized that her life was in danger in fact the man who was heading the ICT department was or died under mysterious circumstances. Musando's death has not been resolved to date. And so the IEBC conducted that election a very trembling body. They were very afraid of what had happened. And so William Ruto knew very well that this uh, had left both the IEBC and the executive uh, arm of the government, two separate bodies, and they were in a, they were they, they, they really existed enmity between them. So what did he do? He knew very well that he needed the IEBC on his side by 2022. So he started quoting them.
And this is where the relationship with the Wafula Chebukati began. You all saw how Chebukati handled the elections. You remember the Jose Kamago who were caught in the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport? And uh, the chairman, Mr. Wafula Chebukati, said that they had invited the Jose Kamago and his team to come and uh, maintain the election materials, the machines. Later, when the forensic audit was done by the former DCI, Mr. George Kinoti, some it was found out that there were some ulterior motives. Ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, you have the USA behind you because you've signed a pact. And this is happening behind your boss's back because Uhuru did not know. And you have the election body, the body that is mandated to manage elections. You have it behind you. And then the judiciary that is supposed to judge whenever election petition reaches their desk is also behind you. If you live in Africa, you will understand what I mean. And if you've ever taken part in an election in Africa, then you will understand what I mean. People have been asking one question. With the intelligence that Uhuru Kenyatta has, because I understand that the president is given an intelligence report in the morning, somewhere in the afternoon and in the evening, he must know what is happening in the country. And very many people are asking, what really happened? Why didn't Uhuru Kenyatta scrutinize and understand what was happening? Was there a power that was much more mightier than his? These are questions that have remained unresolved. Ladies and gentlemen, on the election day after people had voted, in Kenya, and I don't know whether I'm the only person who is saying this, I have never seen any ambassador pitting camp where elections are being counted and verified. But I saw the U.S. ambassador in Bomas when elections were being verified. And I was wondering, what was she doing there? Because always... Ambassadors wait and they are invited when the IBC is going to pronounce the winner of that election. And I have said here before that the U.S. Ambassador, Meg Whiteman, told his, her citizens, the American citizens, not to travel to Kisumu, the strongholds of Raila Mwilidinga, apparently because she thought there was going to be chaos, chaos that were never there. And then... Gutierrez called Raila Bolodina and told him not to take people to the street. Yet Raila had not said that he was going to take people to the street. And ladies and gentlemen, William Ruto had the support of the West. The delegation that was sent to William Ruto on his inauguration day when he was taking oath of office has never been seen in Africa. And very many people thought, wow, what is happening? And today, they lifted the ban on GMO. The ban that had been placed 10 years ago by the former president has been lifted. And as we speak, it is in court because some Kenyans have gone to court claiming that it is being rushed without public participation, without involving stakeholders. The Catholic Church, farmers, and many other stakeholders have talked about it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, some leaders go behind their bosses and they sign pacts with the West. And this is exactly what happened in our country. Today, William Ruto enjoys the support of the West. And we have seen deals going on on their side. Even though he has not really completely moved away from the East, but at least the West is happy because William Ruto has incorporated them. And that is my take, ladies and gentlemen.